Good evening, it's Judy Wicking here from the National Asthma Council Australia and I'm joined with Marg Gordon, um, an asthma and respiratory educator. We've just worked out that we've got a combination of over 50 years of working in general practice and um, both of us have been working as asthma and respiratory educators for the last 10 or 15 years, so great to be with you tonight. Just going to talk to you a little bit about um, what's new in asthma management and talk also a little bit about um, asthma devices and how to use them. So just to let you know that the National Asthma Council Australia, um, all our references are coming from the Australian Asthma Handbook. The last version, um, version 1.1, earlier this year was completed. So there's many references there from um, Asthma in Australia 2001, the Global Initiative for Asthma, which is in international guidelines, and certainly other references are available on request. We're happy to answer some questions at the end of the session, so if you can just keep those um, coming through towards the end of the session, we'll be happy to endeavour to answer them all. So just to give you a little bit of background regarding the Australian guidelines, um, the first treatment guidelines in Australia were developed in 1989 and there was certainly a huge burden of disease and there was nearly a thousand deaths recorded in 1989. So. There was a quick realisation that in primary care, uh, where most asthma is being treated, we needed some help. We needed advice that targeted that particular group of practitioners, particularly general practitioners and health practice nurses. Um, general practitioners were included as co-authors and to ensure that it was relevant and practical to that group. Um, all general practices had them um, posted out to them at that time. And there was an education program to facilitate um, dissemination and implementation of those guidelines. So since then the National Asthma Council Australia have produced six editions of the Australian um, Has Management Handbook um, and we're now um, very excited to highlight the seventh edition which was released last year just over 12 months ago. We have changed the name to uh, the Australian Asthma Handbook, we call it R for short around the office. Um, the new format though is quite different. It is a dedicated state of the art website. Many reasons for this but mainly it's because we've got so much more information now, a book would be just so big and difficult to update regularly. So the advantage of a website is that it can be updated as new medications become available and new information and research becomes available. Studies, um, surveys of users prior to this edition um, highlighted they still wanted uh, some sort of paper-based book that they can keep on the shelf. So there is a quick reference guide available and that's a summary book of all the key messages that um, may be useful in general practice. The web version was updated again um, in, we have now version 1.1 and that was April of this year, 2015. So just to let you know that there are two ways that you can access this handbook. One is via the National Asthma Council website and you can see there just under health professionals where the red lines um, come up there, circles at least, and the Australian Asthma Handbook is on the um, home page which you can just click on and it takes you to our new dedicated website which looks like this. So it's www.asthmahandbook.org.au and that's the home page there and also a picture there of the quick reference guide. And certainly if you want any of these quick reference guides, you just have to contact the National Asthma Council um, via our resource ordering um, process and we'll be able to send you one out free of charge. So what are some of the new um, things that are available? Uh, if you're looking to find that on your, um, if you're on the website and you want to see what's happening, um, you just have to, sorry, just a technical glitch here. You just have to go to the home page and um, if you just go down the bottom of the home page, you'll see recommendations and then another click just a couple down, you'll see what's new. And that will give you a summary of all the major changes that have happened since the last guidelines in 2006. Just a little bit of a snapshot of some of those new priorities and topics. There's a much greater recognition of the lifestyle and risk factors, um, for example, smoking, healthy eating, regular exercise. They're real priorities now um, in, in these new guidelines. There's certainly more emphasis on 
device use, which is really a very important for role of um, practice nurses and primary health care nurses working together with um, um, medical practitioners to ensure that correct device use is used. And Marg's going to um, speak to that in just a moment. There's certainly a greater mention about adherence. Um, so many patients with chronic diseases um, don't take their med day medications um, regularly, so that's a priority. Been a few changes of terms, um, exacerbations for example, we used to use that in asthma management for severe flare ups or attacks, um, that's not going to, you won't see that in the new guidelines. So if someone's having some increased symptoms we would turn that as a flare up and then for more severe flare up of symptoms it would be termed as an asthma attack. There are some great diagnostic algorithms which are quite clear to be able to follow and that's in regard to children and both adults given that adults and children need to be um, diagnosed and treated in a slightly different way. Um, in children, greater emphasis again on trying to work out what is what we call viral induced wheeze, where the children just tending to get infections, respiratory tract infections, triggering some, triggering some asthma symptoms such as cough and wheeze. And then the other group of children might be what we call multi-trigger wheeze, where there is an allergic component to their condition, they may have eczema, um, and may have a stronger family history of asthma, for example, and we would turn that a multi-trigger wheeze. Um, just highlighting that the stepped approach to medication is really important now to recognising that people may not need to stay on the medication strength that they were put on right at the start. Regular assessment and assessment whether they need that dose of medication um, and going, not being um, nervous or scared to step up or step down depending on their level of asthma control. Strategies for trigger management, so making sure we have an understanding of what their person's trigger is. If we know what the person's trigger is, well then we can implement some strategies to avoid that trigger and if they're not avoidable, we'll learn to manage those unavoidable triggers. Um, there are pr protocols for treatment of asthma, flare-ups, attacks, right through from a presentation at general practice to hospital admissions and there's, um, they're really um, fully and comprehensive information about management of those episodes for people with asthma, flare-ups or attacks. Um, certainly there's some specialised groups, adolescents for example, recognising that adolescent period does require a different management um, strategy mainly recognising that there's different psychosocial aspects of care and also um, uh, things like asthma in pregnancy as well. I'm just going to hand over, oh no sorry, I'll just run through some medication types, sorry. Um, just wrecking a little bit of a brush up on the different types of medications, um, there's relievers which anybody with asthma should have. These are our medications that we use for treatment of any flare up of symptoms in that they work really quickly and they tend to relax the smooth muscles of the airways. Preventers however are different. In, generally speaking we would use inhaled corticosteroids, it's the most commonly, common one that we use and those inhaled corticosteroids work on the inflammation in the lining of the airways. And they reduce that inflammation, the redness and swelling and the extra mucus production. They tend to be slow onset of action and they do need to be taken every day. Um, one of the things that preventers we've changed, we don't tend to use the symptom term symptom controller anymore and the reason for this is that internationally symptom controller in other countries has been the same as what we would term a preventer. So given that we um, have a lot of internationally trained doctors, we have nurses that are working in different countries, to be consistent internationally we are not using the term symptom controller as a preventer. Um, and it, it's termed long-acting beta-2 agonists, which is probably more accurate. Long-acting beta-2 agonists also work on the smooth muscle in the lining, in the airway walls to relax those smooth muscles. We then have combination therapies, inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta-2 agonists to um, use for some patients. There are still some available medications that are used occasionally, which we perhaps won't go into detail now. So it's just a brief overview. Um, this is a, an excellent resource I find for, um, I have this as an A4 sheet in my kit when I'm um, talking with patients. It highlights the different groups of medications, so you've got relievers, 
Um, you've got non-steroidal preventers um, down the bottom there, including a, a Montelukast, which is um, a tablet that is often used for children. We've got two, um, corticosteroid preventers. We've got long-acting beta-2 agonist medications as monotherapy in separate devices. Then we've got the group of combination medications listed there and also medications that are just used for COPD. So it's a great route, as we've got, as you can see, a huge range of medications and different devices. This um, chart really helps to put them in perspective and highlight what each um, of those medications do. And again, these are available from the National Asthma Council Australia, should you wish to have one. Or they can be downloaded from our website. So just to mention a couple of the um, um, couple of the uh, new medications, so Cymbicort, combination medication. Um, I just, yeah, thank you. A combination medication, Cymbicort, we've got budesonide and ephemeterol. So these can be used for both adults and children over the age of 12 years, generally for maintenance therapy only. Just highlighting that the new RAPI inhaler um, is a limited dose inhaler, so that's We've now got the same types of medications as we had in the turbulator, but in a metered dose inhaler. So it gives great patient choice um, as to what they would prefer, and more importantly, about what patients can manage. I'm just reminding us that the um, Symbicort Maintenance and Reliever Therapy, or the SMART protocol for short, can be used with both the RAPI inhaler and the turbulator on the lower possible lower doses of these medications, and they're listed there. So the 53 for the RAPI inhaler and the two behave of 106, 100 over 6 and the 206. And they are the only strengths, so the higher strengths are not able to be used for the SMART protocol. Fluidiform is another relatively new combination medication and just um, it's, a slight, it's a metered dose inhaler and that can also be used for adults and children 12 years and over as a maintenance therapy only. It's a twice daily dosing and the doses are 50, over five, so that when you have the hyphen um, or the, the slash there dividing it, the higher number is inhaled corticosteroid dose, the lower number is the um, long-acting beta-2 do dosing of the ephemeterol, 125.5 and then the 250.10. Um, we have another new device now, um, a medication, combination medication for asthma, it's called Brio, Brio Elliptor, Elliptor being the type of device. So. These can also be used for adults and children 12 years of over, maintenance therapy only in that they need a reliever therapy as well to um, work in combination with those medications. Um, it's a once daily dosing and so the beauty of that is that it's only once a day because both the inhaled corticosteroid and the long acting beta 2 agonists have a 24 hour duration of action. Um, for asthma, it's um, 125 dose and the 225 dose. Just a reminder that anticholinergics for asthma, um, the atrovent, some of you may remember, it is only the nebulised dose, so just the nebules um, that are used really for those more severe acute exacerbations or attacks in a hospital emergency department. Um, not the n metered dose inhaler is PBS listed for asthma. So all those medications, it can sometimes be a little confusing as to which one to use and I'll just highlight that the Australian Asthma Handbook um, is certainly about asthma management and when each medication is, um, can be introduced and used and when it's appropriate. Um, just to also remind you that the Lung Foundation Australia has the COPDX guidelines and I find this chart really helpful. It's um, the stepwise approach to um, stable COPD. It talks about mild, moderate and severe and when to introduce different medications. So it's a useful resource also. So I'm just going to hand over now to Marg and she's going to look at devices and inhalers and just um, correct use. Hello. Um, this is always a really popular topic, so we'll just 
think about why we need to know about devices in asthma management. And it's really important to remember that a lot of people, in fact, the studies will show us up to 90% of people use their devices incorrectly. And when we think about medication, it's so easy to swallow a tablet and you get your blood pressure medication, for example, by swallowing a tablet. And for respiratory, of course, we've got to teach people to use their devices. All the medications come with product information, but still we will see if we ask people to show us that they're not using them correctly. The rate of error increases with age, which is really important to remember, so we need to be reminding folk. And it increases with the severity of their airflow limitations. So those with more severe asthma or COPD tend to use their devices less correctly, and these are the group that we really need to be helping. Interestingly, 22 to 56 percent of health professionals also have never had any training or education on device use. So we're here to try and uh, alleviate that a little bit tonight. And of course, there's a lot of resources available for device and inhaler technique. And those videos are on the NAC website or the Lung Foundation website as well. So we need clear instruction and physical demonstration for our patients. and uh, for ourselves. And correct technique is not maintained unless we uh, repeat this regularly. In the situation where I work in general practice clinics, patients come in and see me as, as often as they need to. So we're in the unique position as practice nurses and in primary health care that we can certainly help people with their device technique. The consequences of incorrect device use, of course, are that they're not going to get that medication where we need it. So it's associated with poor asthma control. And one of the first things we would ask if people coming back with less well-controlled asthma is please bring all your medications and devices in and get them to demonstrate what they're doing. Um, if they were not using their device use correctly, then nothing's going to work. So we won't be getting that short-acting beta-2 agonist relief right when we need it. And that's because the medication is not being deposited into the small airways of the lungs. So that leads to an increase in medication usage. People will keep trying to use it. It's not working, so they might use more or they might use less. Um, it increases the cost of what they're doing if they're overusing medication and it's not getting to the right spot. They're getting poorer clinical outcomes. They're coming back to the doctor or the emergency department when they may not need to. And they've got a reduced quality of life. And I know from my work too that they lose confidence in the medication. And we definitely don't want that to happen. We want them to be confident that the medications that they're being prescribed will work. OK, so when we're talking about metered dose inhalers, or puffer is a common term, we get a couple of, or we get some repeated common mistakes that we see. And the most common one is multiple actuations without shaking between doses. So the message is, shake the device, one press, inhale that dose, and then have a rest, shake it again, one press, inhale that dose holding the inhaler in the wrong position so it doesn't work as well if it's upside down. And it sounds bizarre, but I have seen people put it into their mouth upside down. Mistiming the dose, the accutation, and the inhalation. And of course, that's when you're using it without a spacer. So if people are going to use their relievers directly into their mouth, it's quite, um, quite difficult to do correctly. And they'll mistime when they're pressing the device and then inhaling it. Poor seal with the lips around the mouthpiece, so medication's escaping out the sides. Or they're using it with the spacer in the wrong way, and that's where they're putting multiple doses, multiple presses of the device into the spacer without shaking in between. Devices can easily uh, be past their expiry date, particularly the relievers. If they're not using very much of it, then it can be past the use-by date. And we need to make sure people can see where that is on the device using it when it's empty. So if they've got a new device, we just need to remind patients to check their priming instructions as well. It's happening for me, Judy. <laughs> it didn't happen to you. OK. 
Turbohaler common mistakes. So turbohaler um, are quite a simple device to use if people are shown what to do, but they do need to be held upright when they're dosing. So when you're doing the turning and click, you need to be holding the device upright, not over on its side. They need to be taught to do a full loading manoeuvre, so that's twisting it one way and then back till it clicks for every single dose. With dry powder devices, it's really important to breathe out before they breathe in. So they need to hold the device away from their mouth, empty their lungs by breathing out, and then putting the device in their mouth and doing a big, strong, deep breath in. Uh, another common mistake is to not breathe in deeply and strongly. So a nice, big, deep, strong inhalation for every dose. We need to uh, make sure that the device doesn't get wet inside. So as I said, not to let people breathe back into the device and to keep the cap on or to close the device when they're not using it. Once again, checking that it's not past its expiry date and reminding people, particularly with the turbohaler, that the device is empty when the dose window reads red and zero, even though if they shake it, they'll still hear a noise. People that have been changed over from meter dose inhalers to turbohalers often think they need to shake a turbohaler, but you don't need to do that. If the device is new, once again, checking the priming instructions, because with turbohalers you do two clicks of the device before the first dose is ready to be loaded. Okay, Accuhaler, another dry powder device. Once again, quite a simple device to use, but somehow people still get them wrong. This is a dry powder device as well, so it's important that the device is clicked back to closed when it's not in use, so we're keeping that moisture out. Once again, not breathing into the device so that they're not putting moisture in. People need to be taught to breathe, empty their lungs, so breathe out before they breathe through the device and making sure they can do a nice, strong, deep inhalation. They don't need to hold their breath for too long after each inhalation, so they can take the device out of their mouth and hold the breath. And once again, checking the use-by dates and making sure that they're not using it past when the device is empty. Accuhalers do have a dose counter on them as well, but it's quite small, so you might need to point that out for people. Now this slide just shows some of the newer devices. So we've got um, the breath activated auto inhaler. So you just uh, to use that, you click the little lever up, and when you breathe in, it clicks and the, the dose is um, expired when with the breath activated. Genuair is quite a new device for a COPD medication, and it's quite natty. It's very simple to use. You just click it down. It'll be green when it's good to breathe. People breathe in and it'll go back to red to show them that the medication's been used. Sorry. Okay. Breathe Taylor is another device for COPD. So just click open the little lid, pop the capsule in, squeeze it shut and away you go. People are probably quite familiar with the uh, Spiriva, the handy inhaler, so where you're popping a little capsule in piercing the device and then breathing in. And we talked about Elipta, which is a new device, once again, very simple to use, just opening it, big breath in, it's got a nice big dose counter there on the side. So lots of these new devices are being scripted now, so if you can get onto your reps and get some placebos, then it's a great idea so that you've got them in your practices there and you can demonstrate the use of that device with your patients when they come in. Okay, it's really important to remember it's not the drugs, but it's what people do with the drugs that make the difference. Particularly important when we're talking about our asthma medications because we want them to get down to those small airways. Now I'm just going to talk about spaces for a while. So we re do recommend that spaces are used with all metered dose inhalers and puffers. That's for all age groups, adults and children alike. This is not new for new information, but it tends to get missed out there in the community. Most adults will believe they don't need to use a spacer anymore. So spacers are recommended for all patients on inhaled corticosteroids or the combinations, and that's of course to reduce the side effects of the corticosteroid component of those medications. For children of all ages, 
for all adults with limited coordination, so talking once again about our older population or those with severe um, airway limitation. And of course when we're delivering our relievers for an acute asthma episode. But NAC would recommend that a spacer is used for anyone that's using a metered dose inhaler or puffer. Why are we using spacers? Well, we're using them to increase the medication of depos the deposition of the medication. So with a metered dose inhaler alone, we only get about 10 to 12 percent deposition of medication. And if you're trying to treat asthma, then we need a lot more than that. If you add in a spacer, then we're getting greater than 30 percent deposition of medication. You can easily see how important that is. And as I said, to reduce the oral complications of inhaled corticosteroids, which are usually the oral thrush or um, mouth ulcers or dysphonia. If you use a spacer with those medications, then you'll largely uh, reduce all of those complications. This is a wonderful demonstration of um, the deposition of medication that I've been referring to. So the slide A is uh, a picture showing someone who's used the puffer straight in their mouth and you can see massive medication deposition in the mouth and into the large bronchi of the lungs and once again right down here into the gut. So we're not getting medication into the small airways of the lungs here and we're getting medication into the gut. So we're going to get reduced benefit of the medication and more side effects. Over here you can see that all we've done is use the same dose with a spacer and look where the medication goes. Widespread across the small airways of the lungs right where we want it so it's going to work and much less in the stomach so less side effects as well. This is a very powerful picture to um, show patients. It's taken under a PET scan image and it really is a great resource to show people. So with spaces it's important that we use them correctly of course and I did uh, speak before about using multiple puffs into the spacer so that's without shaking in between. If you put multiple presses, two presses into the spacer without shaking then you reduce the medication by 33% and for five puffs up to 50%. So it's really important to remember shake, one press into the spacer, that's one dose, the patient inhales, take it out of the mouth, shake again, one press, take three or four more breaths through the spacer and you're getting the full benefit of that medication. The spacer needs to be age and skills appropriate for the person and luckily now we've got such a variety of spaces and you can see them there on the screen. We've got small volume, larger volume, we've got different shapes, sizes for people, we've got lovely silicon masks that fit so those children or older patients who may benefit from a mask can get one that's going to fit them. So don't be thwarted if people come in and they can't use their puffer and spacer. Just sit with them, teach them, show them, demonstrate or think about using a different style of spacer or adding in a mask. Sometimes it's as easy as that to help people have much more confidence with their medication. We need to make sure that the spacer is compatible with the with the prescribed medication and really now that only uh, regards to the volumatic because that's the only one now that hasn't got a silicon rubber end to it. So I'm talking about if we've got different medications with different shaped puffers then they need to be able to fit into the spacer and that's a silicon, usually the one of the ones with a silicon end. So we often get asked about caring for the spacer or how long you should use a spacer for and if it's a single, if it's a solo person using that spacer, so sometimes in families you can get kids using, uh, lots of children using the same spacer, but if it's one person using one spacer then we usually say it can be cleaned about once a month and it's important that it's cleaned properly. So warm soapy water wash, normal dishwashing liquid, no rinsing or towel drying and air drying it overnight. So demonstrate to the person that the spacer is pulled right apart and unscrew both ends or one end, whichever way that spacer works, to just pull it all apart, show them how to do it, demonstrate the washing, no rinsing and air drying overnight. 
The spaces nowadays last a good long time, at least six to 12 months and often longer. And when they bring them in, we just need to check that the spacer is intact. So it hasn't got cracked, its valve is still functioning, they haven't lost any little vital parts of the spacer. And that should last them a long time nowadays. I find that spaces have really improved. So this is just an example of some of the limited life spaces or more disposable style spaces. And you can see that um, some of these should be replaced much sooner. The little light here, which is just a cardboard uh, spacer that flat, uh, goes flat, uh, because it is cardboard, should only be used for about a week. Sometimes people are given these now in emergency departments and then if they bring them into the practice weeks and weeks later at still using them, then they do tend to um, deteriorate a little, a little bit by just being cardboard. The e-chamber ones there shown are really great spaces made out of very durable plastic and they say to replace them after 12 months. And e-chamber there can be used on for six months. These are these are ones too that many people are given now in ED departments. So you might see these coming in and people can use them. A lot of the reps will give spaces out into the practices. So you might be able to help people with a space that you can give them if the cost is a problem for them. I usually try to explain to people that the cost of the spaces is quite minimal when we understand that we're getting much better medication deposition. Oh, we always have to talk about nebulizers in asthma management and particularly in primary care settings. So NAC do recommend that nebulizers are only used for acute uh, life-threatening asthma or when people require continuous salbutamol and oxygen. They're not recommended for home use anymore and for many reasons. They're expensive to buy and they need a power source. So in comparison to our puffer and spacer, for example, or our dry powder device, we can use those anywhere. We don't need to be hitched up to electricity. They're inefficient. So only about 10% of the medication is delivered to the lower airways. And you'll remember me talking about that above 30% deposition with MDI and spacer. So that's a far more effective way to administer the medication. All nebulizers are, uh, require regular servicing and cleaning, so 12 monthly servicing. And if you ask people how long they've had that nebulizer, it's often 10, 20 years. They might use it once or twice a year. They've never had it serviced at all. So it's probably not even getting the 10% effective delivery to the airways. And we need new tubing and mask at least every three months. Once again, quite an expense for people if they do need to do that. And apart from that, this lovely picture here demonstrates what can happen to tubing and masks if it's not cleaned at home. And this photograph was given to Judy and I through a colleague of ours where this patient kept coming back into the outpatient's department with pseudomonas pneumonia. And finally, uh, <coughs> the nurse was able to do a home visit to find out what was going on and this is what she found at home. So, really a great reminder that very few people will look after that equipment correctly. So really insisting or encouraging people to use um, puffers and spaces in preference to nebulizers. Um, and just a reminder of why that is, so they're, um, they're equally as effective in a hospital situation, so there's no difference between giving somebody with acute asthma, their reliever therapy through a puffer and spacer as through a nebulizer in terms of hospital admission rates. So it's uh, meter dose inhaler and spacers resulted in fewer side effects for people, lower pulse rates in children, less deterioration in blood gases, shorter stays in emergency departments for children and more cost effective. So there's just no reason anymore to have a nebulizer. Just having a little dual readjustment there. All right, so when we talk about inhaled medications and devices, there can always be a little bit of confusion there or choice there, and we recognise that that's not necessarily uh, a registered nurse's choice unless we're um, 
able to prescribe, but we might be able to at least help our GPs to uh, determine if patients are not getting or not managing their devices correctly. So we need to remember that the device needs to be age and skills appropriate. So watching that person use the device, if at all possible, demonstrating with our placebo devices if we can, and just really reinforcing that people can use their devices basically correctly. If we've got people on multiple devices, then it's really great if we can have them on this multiple medications, I beg your pardon, it's great if we can have them on the same type of device and that's just less room for error, less confusion. Checking how people are using their device use and remembering that we need to keep our own um, device use up to date. Checking patients quite regularly, so three to six monthly ask people to bring their devices in and get them to show you what they're doing. And checking their adherence, so actually open, asking open-ended questions about their devices. Not just saying, are you taking your medications, I'll always say yes, but saying, how are, you, how are you going using your medicine, are you using it twice a day, what's going on, checking with them how they're going. Uh, we did talk about using, um, watching some device use videos and these are available on the Nation, National Asthma Council website. So the web address there, www.nationalasthma.org.au and there's, uh, device, there's videos there on device and space use that patients can watch or you, indeed you can watch yourselves to upgrade your own um, knowledge on using them. So health professional tips, making sure your own knowledge of the devices is quite current. Get people to show you how they're using their devices. Uh, remembering that you, they, you, they might have shown you that a few months ago, but just getting them to show you again is really helpful at the review visit. Using a checklist might be really helpful and these are available on the NPS website or on the National Asthma Council website. Trying to explain what to do or demonstrating what to do, not just giving a leaflet can really help people, that physical demonstration. And reviewing the use at every visit if you possibly can, at least once or twice a year is advised. And our assessment tools, as we said, there's checklists available, there's a device information paper through the National Asthma Council. Uh, the, the National Prescribing Service has a device use checklist which is really helpful and there's device instruction sheets for patients on the Lung Foundation Australia website as well. Alrighty, Judy. Um, 11506, you can use that item number. Um, the nurse can certainly assist in collecting that information and provision of that um, education. Um, general practice management plans can be used and these can be done every two years, so item 7 to 1. So this is for anyone with a chronic disease. Um, the nurse can certainly assist in collecting that information and provision of that in education um, that can be incorporated, incorporated into that plan of that in education um, that can be incorporated, incorporated into that plan, such as self-management education, um, explanation of how to use their written asthma action plan which the doctor may have developed and certainly um, assessing device use is a few examples. Um, team care arrangements for those that have um, chronic diseases but they have complex um, requirements and needs and these can be also done every two years and the nurse can assist in collecting that information, provision and contacting other providers. Um, the review of those GP management plans, item number three, 732 or a coordinated review with the team care um, is in place, team care management is in place. This can be reviewed every three months. Um, the nurse can certainly assist in collecting information and provision of education. Supporting MDS, <laughs> sorry I've just been told I was on mute for some of that. So. Uh, where do I start from? 
right back. I'll oh, right back at the start. Sorry. Okay. Um, so just going back to that, sorry about that. Um, just talking about the item numbers that can be used for asthma management um, with regard to um, people that we see with respiratory health ne needs. Certainly a health assessment and spirometry can be done um, to identify and assist in the diagnosis of asthma and COPD. And spirometry is certainly a, um, something that um, trained practice nurses can um, perform in their role. Um, certainly in general practice uh, we have the GP management plans, the item 721. This can be done every two years for anyone who has a chronic disease. The nurse can certainly be involved in the development of that plan and many of the aspects of care for someone with chronic disease such as self-management education, assessment of their device use, checking their device use, again using spirometry um, can be um, done by the practice nurse. Team care arrangements can be done for those that have a chronic disease and complex needs. Um, item 723 and that can also be done every two years of which the nurse um, in general practice can be quite involved in the development of that plan and then carrying out some of the um, goals and strategies and can also be a team, play, team member um, if they have a specific um, area of expertise that they can help with that um, chronic disease management. We can also do the review of those plans and that can be the 732 and um, and they can be, you know, both of those review item numbers um, can be used if both plans are in place. And these can be done every three months. And again, the nurse can be involved in um, reviewing of all the goals and strategies documented in those plans. There are other item numbers that can be used. The practice nurse item number 10997. There are five item, there are five consult, nurse education consultations can be done per year for anyone that has one of those GP management plans in place. The asthma cycle of care, um, consisting of those five key elements, ensuring that the diagnosis is correct, um, reviewing medications and device use, helping with self-management education, reviewing and, um, the, and teaching patients to use their written asthma action plans and then reviewing that action plan and other aspects of care um, in, it can be incorporated and then the, once those five elements have been completed they can claim the asthma cycle of care. Five allied health visits can be also used for those um, people with the complex conditions. Um, and there's of course a medication management review which is often useful for people of the older age group where there are multiple medications. Um, I think they're invaluable resource and perhaps underutilised using the skills of um, qualified and experienced and trained a pharmacist to help with making sure that there's no you know, medication interaction and people are aware of exactly what they're taking. So when do we do these item numbers? Um, certainly there's um, requirements there that we need to abide by. So health assessment, spirometry, the GP management plan, team care arrangement, and nurse education can be done in that first consultation and the subsequent um, visits within three months. But after three months we can certainly do the review item numbers together with ongoing education and involvement um, provided by the nurse. Um, we can do another review item numbers, um, again, seven to nine months, and then again, um, later on, we can do um, every three months, you can do a review. Usually, I find that isn't um, necessary, um, maybe two or three reviews, but it depends on each individual patient and the complexity of their condition. The asthma service incentive payment, or the SIP for short, can be claimed once all the key elements that I mentioned have been covered but not within three months of one of the review item numbers. Um, so the GP management plan and team care arrangements are essentially a plan of action, um, recognising goals and strategies that can be undertaken to care for that patient in, in the future, whereas the asthma service incentive payment is recognising that we've covered all what is best practice that is going to help keep the patient well, hopefully keep them out of hospital and so it's sort of um, at the end once you've completed all the elements you can claim that item number. Okay, so that come to the end of the formal section um, of our presentation discussion but we're certainly open to questions now and, and happy to chat to, to those questions. Over here, just here. So, 
Okay, if a person, if there's a, there's a question here, if a person on multiple inhalers, can they use this one spacer or do they need different spacers for each inhaled medication? Great question. And probably um, if it's for the one person, recommend they have the one spacer and they can use different medications with that one spacer. So it's more about having a, a spacer for each individual is, is good. There's no reason that you need different spacers for different medications. One down. Um, no. yeah. You just answer those. Multiple need the same spacer, just have to get one puff at a time. Can do that one, Mark? Okay. The question is, can multiple medications through the same spacer just just have to give one puff at a time? Is that the question? Mm. That, that's right. So if you've got a metered dose inhaler, you definitely just need to be using one puff at a time, no matter, no matter what the medication is. So it's always one puff at a time and then either one big breath in or tidal breathing when you're using a spacer. Um, the question, another question is, can a cycle of care be claimed without a GPMP? And yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the cycle of care asthma SIP item number can be claimed once the five elements of the SIP have been met. So a person doesn't need to have a GPMP to have the cycle of care item number. Remembering that that item number can only be claimed once in every 12 months and it is a time-based item number. So you've got level B, C and D of the SIP. Another question here, is there any evidence that homemade spaces will work if nothing else is available? Um, probably the main comment would be that there's probably not much evidence to say it will work. However, I like the point that if there's nothing else available, certainly trying to um, give a person a reliever when it's needed, um, you can in improvise. And some of the suggested improvisations that I've heard from folk is using um, a paper cup, a, a polystyrene cup where you can put the larger um, open end of the cup over the nose and the mouth and then just punch a hole in the other end where you can put the, um, the inhaler in. Um, I have heard too that you know using a, an empty um, small lemonade bottle or a large lemonade bottle where you can use the neck of the lemonade bottle um, for example in the, as a mouthpiece and just cut a hole in the other end. So certainly if there is no spacer available and the patient is unable to use a puffer on its own, there can be improvisation, but um, there's no evidence to say that it will make, uh, that it works. We don't have that sort of information, but um, anything that you can use is, is better than nothing. Uh, there's a question there about peak flow recommendations. So we don't tend to use peak flow meters as much as we did because um, we've got far greater access to spirometry, which is a much more comprehensive test for asthma and will give us a lot more information. But peak flow meters can still be used for people if they're uh, quite poor at recognising their symptoms. It's often a good idea. So they need to be able to use uh, their own peak flow meter at home and use it morning and night for at least two weeks recording that um, reading. Uh, and that might help people to recognise that when, what their asthma is doing if they're not uh, good at recognising their own symptoms. Sometimes people will use peak flow, rec um, peak flow readings when they've made medication changes so that patients can monitor whether they think they're getting a benefit to that. But they're not used as much as they were in the past. Certainly now we like to talk about people managing their asthma with symptom recognition and managing, uh, treating their symptoms. Um, another question has come up about um, the best inhaler to use for arthritic hands and certainly many of the older folk um, have dexterity issues with arthritic hands or maybe they've had a stroke and struggle um, using their fingers. Um, it really is, you just have to tailor it for each individual patient. There are some um, for 
some patients if you've got a metered dose inhaler, there is a device called a inhaler aid and that's made by um, GSK who make um, medications such as um, Ventolin, Asmol and Serotide and there's a larger one for the Ventolin inhaler and there's a smaller one for the Serotide inhaler and they can be very useful and often I find that I've got a, a patient with a dexterity issues, they would have a small volume spacer with a rubber end with their inhaler and the inhaler aid and they can manage it quite well. Um, some patients might be able to use a dry powder device but it's really um, where they just twist with the base of their hand rather than using their fingers. So it is important to make sure that patient is suitable for each individual device and that they can manage it. And the way that you do that is really just checking their device use um, when they come back for a review or if possible even when they get their script. Uh, there's a question asking uh, if people are tidal breathing, how do you shake in between? So I'm presuming that means if you're tidal breathing through the spacer. So um, what we get people to do of course is to, uh, as I said, connect the device and the spacer together, shake it, one dose into the spacer and then they can tidal breathe through that spacer, three to four breaths take it all out of their mouth, shake it all again, they don't need to disconnect the device from the spacer, pop it back in their mouth, another press, tidal breathe and they just continue to do that however many doses of medication they're needing. Um, so there's another question here regarding um, just asking about when a volumatic inhaler will be used. Well, a volume, volumatic is actually a large volume spacer. And so a large volume spacer can be used for um, generally people with bigger lungs and they use that with a metered dose inhaler. Um, evidence and research suggests that if you've got big lungs, use a big spacer such as the volumatic, um, little lungs using smaller um, spaces. However, I always um, ensure that as long as the space has been used, because I had a 15 year old boy that wasn't keen on having a great big volumatic in his school bag, but he was comfortable with having a smaller volume spacer. So really it is about making sure we tailor it um, to each individual person that we're, we're caring for. Uh, there's a question saying please explain the SIP payment. So uh, the SIP payment is um, a service incentive payment for the asthma cycle of care, which level B is item number 2546. To complete the SIP payment or to claim that item number, you need to complete the five key elements required for that item number. Um, number one is document the diagnosis and assessment of the severity of the asthma and the level of asthma control. Reviewing the patient's use of and adherence to their asthma related medication and device. Providing a written asthma action plan. Providing that person with some asthma self management education and then reviewing the written asthma action plan. The item number can only be claimed once in a 12 month period. So hopefully that answers that question. I guess the only thing to um, say with that, that you don't claim the asthma SIP with a standard consultation because within that SIP payment it's generated that you will get a consultation item number and then you will get a bonus $100 which comes under the PAP um, practice incentive payment tip system um, and that $100 goes um, to sort of help cover for the extra time that's being used to complete all the key elements. So it, it's just an item number that's used on its own, not in conjunction with any other consultation item number. Um, <coughs> There's a little confusion. The review item numbers can be claimed under six monthly if required. So the question was about the I-732 um, can only be claimed every six months um, and only three between the 721 and 723. But they can be claimed um, three monthly if required. It's a clinical, um, you know, depends on how frequent that person needs to come back for a review and what is covered um, according to the the GP management plan and all the team care arrangements and what communication has been had with the other um, team members of that plan. Uh, the, the question says uh, how much Ventolin can be taken in one go when someone is having an attack? So we're talking about acute asthma management and the general rule of thumb is that children six years and under 
you would give uh, four to six puffs of Ventolin and monitor their response in an acute episode. And for six and above, you can give six to 12 puffs and then monitor their response. And you can keep administering that, that um, Ventolin until help arrives. In the community, you would remember that we go to the asthma four by four by four. So that's four puffs, four breaths for each puff, wait four minutes, monitor the response and continue that four by four by four until help arrives. Have you got anything to add? For that? No, I think it's just differentiating. Sometimes there's a bit of confusion differentiating between community first aid, which is what we, Marg was just mentioning, the four by four um, plan, which has been um, published, um, pub, um, marketed and promoted for a long time by the Asthma Foundations and other organisations and that tends to be what childcare workers, teachers um, and perhaps uh, sporting groups are trained in. It's very appropriate for that group. When Marg mentions the under six, puff, under six year old, six puffs, over six year old, you can have six to twelve puffs. That's probably more medical management by health professionals. But I, I guess the principle is if someone is having asthma symptoms, you give them a reliever, you monitor the response. If the, the, the medication, the reliever is not working, you give them more. Um, and then if it's really not working or if the patient's deteriorating, you would call um, triple O or seek urgent medical help. Uh, there's a question there asking, do we see much vocal cord dysfunction in exercise-induced asthma? Uh, I think the way I would answer is that, that these two are quite distinct conditions. So vocal cord dysfunction is a condition standalone. It can be confused with asthma, but it's not necessarily part of asthma. Exercise-induced asthma is where that person only gets their asthma symptoms in relation to exercise. So they're two quite distinct medical conditions there. Another question is, what is the time frame waiting between uh, between pre and post spirometer puff are given. So when we're performing spirometry, um, in general practice particularly, we will always do pre and post bronchodilator. So you do at least three, sometimes I find between three and five blows to ensure that we get three technically acceptable and reproducible results. And there's criteria that needs to be um, met to ensure that we're getting that repeatability. Then we would give um, four separate puffs of a salbutamol via a spacer, um, wait 10 to 15 minutes. Then we would repeat the spirometry um, readings again, um, ensuring that we're meeting start and end criteria and getting repeatable um, results. So, Bronchodilator between pre and post spirometry is four recommendations by the Australian guidelines is four separate puffs, salbutamol so via a spacer. Uh, there's a question saying should we prime the spacer after cleaning with four to five puffs of Ventolin? Um, when we chatted about the cleaning of spaces, if they're cleaned correctly with the um, warm soapy water and not rinsed in between and air dried, then that reduces the static between the um, medication and the plastic of the spacer and there's no need to prime the spacer. However, in general practice, if you're autoclaving your spaces to sterilise them and then they're not being washed with warm soapy water, there can still be some static there after the sterilising process. So in that situation, you may want to prime the spacer if you're administering the Ventolin. In the home situation, there's no need for people to prime their spaces at all. It's a total waste of medication. Another really good question. Does the practice nurse initiate Ventolin treatment in a patient presenting with an asthma attack if the GP is not available? The question from, comes from a practice manager. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I would encourage each individual practice to develop a policy and procedure about their situation because it's certainly a very real one. As far as I'm initiating first aid for asthma, I think there's a duty of care there, Marg's nodding, um, for the nurse. If there's no one else there, they have a duty of care to initiate asthma first aid. And they are covered to do that by the 4 by 4 by 4 Anybody in the community can administer Ventolin if they're concerned that someone can't breathe. 
um, under the asthma first aid plan, which is four by four by four. So a practice nurse could certainly do that if no GP was available, um, without um, that being ordered as a medication. So that at least gives you a start to get that person on some treatment while someone else is hopefully dialing triple O for you. Um, another question here, how do you classify moderate to severe asthma? Um, that's a bit of a loaded question really because um, number one I would need to differentiate between um, adults and children um, and I think the other thing is the new guidelines are probably gearing more about assessing adult asthma is to what amount of medication is needed to keep that asthma under control. So when we're looking at people with asthma, we assess asthma control and um, prescribing of medication as appropriate to their symptoms and then the step up and down approach. But probably with that question, I would certainly um, suggest you have a good look at the um, quick reference guide and if there's any um, particular questions, you can certainly email that to um, me. I guess that leads to another um, thought that if you have any questions come up in the near future or any time really, you can certainly email the National Asthma Council Australia, just nac at nationalasthma.org.au with your question and just put attention, Judy or Marg and we'll endeavour to add that, um, answer that question as soon as possible. So I think um, that's probably it for this evening. Um, we'll be guided by um, our colleagues here. <laughs> thank you all for thank you all for logging the session in. and logging in. All the very best.